We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Datable listeners 10% off your first order with code Datable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So so what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. Hi, I'm Yue Shu. And I'm Julie Kraftchik. This is the Dateable Podcast. Where we dive into everything about modern dating and relationships. Welcome to the show. Hi, Datables. Welcome to another episode of Datable Podcast. Have we all recovered from all the candy we had from Valentine's Day <laughs> last week? I may have eaten my big box that I got in three days. <laughs> Not proud of that moment. <laughs> but I haven't gone for half off candy yet. I so that's either. A, that's a win. <laughs> yeah, I need to get on that train. I uh, went to my parents' house the day before Valentine's Day, my mom had the little candy hearts. I haven't seen those in oh, years, like since I grade school. Either. And I asked her where she got it. And she said it was some like real estate agent that was passing them out. <laughs> so unromantic. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping she'd be like, your dad. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, just some real estate agent. <laughs> See, love comes from everywhere. Yes. Even real estate agents. Especially when you're trying to make some money from house sales. Exactly. <laughs> love bombing all the way. <laughs> How was your V-Day? It was good. I'm actually continuing it this weekend. So nice. this is before I'm going. We're doing this intro right before. So we're doing a belated dinner when, you know, things quiet down a little. But we yeah. actually did in the middle of the week. It was Tuesday, as you all know, this year. We did gifts and I was super cheesy. I can share what I did. I Please. have been waiting for a moment that I could let my cheese flag fly. Oh, boy. Use that. I don't know how I feel about <laughs> feel about cheese flag but yeah wave that cheese flag <laughs> so we did um just before i go into the cheesiness we did another type of cheesiness we made chicken parm like a homemade version yes, that delicious it's actually pretty labor intensive and it's a special occasion type of meal so we usually do taco tuesdays we decided to you know level up. It up a little <laughs> level up exactly so my cheesiness is I had this idea and I feel like it was inspired by something on 
this podcast, probably. I actually think I remember the episode from like way back in the day when we had David Cruz on the podcast. Oh, I love him. Yes, he was from The Millionaire Matchmaker and Mm -hmm. he was just so sweet. And he talked about just like, you know, how you can inject romance. And I feel like I've had this idea for so long, but haven't had the need to do it yet. So what I did was I bought post-it notes And I wrote 50 things I loved about my partner and put them all over the house. Oh, that is so cute. (laughs) And then the last one was a card with a rose, a single rose. (laughs) I I don't know. I like giving on Valentine's Day just as much as receiving. And I don't believe like it should be just women that are receiving on Valentine's Day. Yeah. Oh, that's very cute. I don't think it's cheesy. I think it's very sweet. And then I got a big orchid. My partner always likes to get me orchids, and a few of them have not made it, hence the need for new orchids every so often. So it is a massive one and also got chocolates. He was hiding the orchid in the closet. I did not see it for days, which was pretty good. So I was impressed, like, you know, not going to shame anyone. Of course, even if you go out day of and you get your stuff, that's still good. I still commend anyone that does what they need to do to give their person some love. But I did like that he did it a few days early. That makes me happy. You're not like one of the last minute people scrambling. That's very sweet. (laughs) I love that. That's very cute. Which also brings up this this issue that I've been running into is like, how do you surprise each other when you live together? (laughs) It's really hard to hide things. (laughs) I know. He, I also live in a one bed. He said that he's like, I realized how limited of options there are to like hide things, which, you know, maybe is good for the long haul, right? That you're not hiding each things from each other. But yeah, it is very difficult. What about you? What was your Valentine's Day like? It was super romantic. Um, s- stomach virus <laughs> that's been going around. <laughs> I thought you were being serious for a minute. I was like, oh. It was a really, really romantic <laughs> Stomach day. Stomach bug. Um, oh, my God. The, the no, no, norovirus? Is that what it's called? A- anyway. Nothing says Valentine's Day like a stomach bug. <laughs> like a, <laughs> like showing it from both ends, you know? Uh, <laughs> That's how you test the love of your partner. <laughs> Will they stay with you? <laughs> right. Yes. The things that you can't, some things you can't hide when you live together so that was <laughs> that was fun but we did go see a show as a one woman play called Christina Wong Sweatshop Overlord it's a play about this performance artist who during COVID started this mask making initiative with a bunch of aunties mm. or she calls them aunties auntie however you want to say it but like these older women all across the US volunteering their time to make masks during COVID and it's she goes through everything that happened from the day of lockdown to today. And there's some things that like I totally forgot, like the fires. I totally forgot the fires oh, yeah. happened. There's a lot we've suppressed on purpose, yes. <laughs> I feel like everything happened in 2020. The elections, it was just such a weird year. And she goes through all that. But then from the lens of her little apartment where she's organizing this huge initiative of making masks. And it went from like making two masks in the beginning to like by the end they made th- over 300,000 masks and sent it to wow. um, to people who really needed them so that I it was a really touching story but she told it from a really funny lens and in it she talks about how she's like should I have spent my time trying to have children instead of like being a performance mm. artist and now I'm, during COVID now that I'm thinking about having children I can't because I can't even leave my house so all the things that come up, you know, I think it, it was very relatable, all the things that come up for you. We got these tickets a long time ago, but it just happened to fall on Valentine's Day. That's nice, though. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It's nice to have like an activity planned. Yes, definitely. And we had a chicken noodle soup for our tummies. So we Ooh. had a very nice meal there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you survived the play with the stomach bug. That's an accomplishment. <laughs> but I will say this. Every year I say I don't like Valentine's Day. I 
I don't want to celebrate it. And now after this year's Valentine's Day came and went, I feel like I want to celebrate it now. I Like what you did with your partner, just a gesture of love and romance, I think goes a long way. It doesn't have to be something grand. You don't have to make a plan. But maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm going to bring this up to my partner next year. Maybe we get each other a homemade gift of some yeah. sort. Or, you know, I think a gesture is nice. And I'm going to bring that up. Every year I'm like, I'm cool. I hate the day. I don't need to celebrate. And this year I th- I had a little FOMO. It's like, I think we should celebrate it. Because what's the difference between you being in love with someone and like you not being in love with someone is that you want to show that love, right? And if yeah. you have an opportunity to show it, I want to take that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I'm very excited for Obakaze tonight. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. It's going to be amazing. So one of my favorite places, my partner made this reservation a few weeks back, which was really sweet. And very excited about that. So don't want to undermine that. But I did really like doing just like the at home version because it, it felt yeah. very chill. And it felt like what you were saying, an opportunity to connect. We also have gotten these games that this was really fun this is not an ad i wish they were a paid sponsor but they're not it's called happily have you ever heard of this Uh, it's no for couples basically it's at home date nights you get a box every month there was a intro to salsa dancing that was part of this Mm. one an ice cream making kit and a game of questions like how well do you know your partner so we did the salsa dance for like 10 minutes out of 20 and then we abandoned ship on it (laughs) and we did not do the ice cream because we're gonna save it because i do actually have an ice cream maker but we did do the card game and it was super fun and some of them were really obvious like there were questions like what was the worst part of your first date some of them they did like bring things up that i'm like this is questionable it was like reminded us of like fights we got it into we're like maybe they shouldn't (laughs) be putting that like on this game for people (laughs) don't need to go there you know (laughs) it's like what was your first fight about and there was some though that were really funny that it was like for example my partner got one that was if you could be any movie star to like play your life who would it be so he had like basically Mm. he had an answer serve for himself and then Mm. we swap cards and we you could put like tiles on them to bet so if you Mm. thought you knew the answer to one you would put more tiles on that you had to get rid of all your tiles or you could always you could only put three max on one except for the lightning round where you could put all 10 tiles on a card so it was very exciting but it was funny because like some of them like we're like we don't even know the answer for ourselves like how are you gonna guess this but others were obvious (laughs) That's really fun. It's like the newlywed game. Yeah, it was fun. It was really fun. So I think just doing stuff like that and spending the night in, you know, I sometimes feel like just watching TV is our default and it's not a great default in my opinion. It's just too easy, right? But I do really like these nights where you can stay in, cook a nice meal together, play a game like this, really talk over dinner, like eat at the kitchen table, like the dining room table, not at the TV. Like I really enjoy that. Yeah, It's the difference between quality time and time spent together. They're very different. So differentiating the two is so important in a relationship. It's so important when you're dating, especially if you're trying to get sexy, right? Relating it back to our episode. (laughs) And we've talked about this in previous episodes with Emily Nagoski about what turns people on. And a lot of the time, it's your environment. It's the working up to the moment. Uh, Like for me, for instance, I cannot get turned on right away if it's like too hot in my apartment or Mm. if it's too hot anywhere. There are just certain things that you have to set up. And I think having quality time before intimacy turns me on so much. It makes me feel connected to my partner. Yeah, and we even talk about it on this episode about the TV example and how that could be detrimental. You get tired. The last thing you want to do is have sex. But, you know, I feel like we've had a lot of sex conversations on this podcast, but every time I learn something different. Mm -hmm. This one, this is based on the book that just came out that we got an advanced copy for. Uh And this is the book called Sex Talks by Vanessa Marin, 
who is a sex therapist, and then her husband, Xander. So we have both of them on the podcast. It's just the way they even introduce Xander as the husband, as the guy, right? But the two of them, by sharing just honest conversations and ways they approach sex, and you'll hear through their story that even for sex therapists, sometimes it can be hard to have sex, especially in long-term relationships. This conversation was just really great in the sense that it brought to light the the fact that we're often so afraid to talk about sex, but you can do it in a way that doesn't feel so confrontational. I feel like in the past when we've had conversations about talking about sex, it's always when there's something wrong and they get Mm. ahead of it so much. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Sex is such a sensitive topic for so many people, especially when you're single, you forget sometimes. I remember just being single and being like, once I'm in a relationship, we're going to be having sex all the time because it's there and, uh, you know, I'll never be short of sex. And then you get in a relationship, you realize there's so much more to it. And if you don't talk about it, you end up just inserting your own assumptions into what you think is happening. And that is the ultimate sex killer is when you are assuming what your partner's thinking or wanting to do. Yeah, this episode is great. Like no matter your relationship status, like last week's episode, Single and Happy, we still said it was applicable for people that are in relationships. And same for this. Even if you feel like you're in a dry spell currently, I think just talking about it gets you a little revved up too. And that could translate to just the way your vibe and energy is out of the universe. But also we talk about non-creepy ways to talk about sex even early on. Not creepy (laughs) is the key word. (laughs) Key word. Yes. So we'll get into this conversation. First, I just want to say thank you to everyone who attended the public happy hour in our Facebook group. It was a great turnout. uh, And apparently a member of our community revealed his girlfriend (laughs) to the group. It was like a first reveal. (laughs) We've actually had that happen two or three other times, right? Someone brought their significant other Love it. onto a happy hour. So funny. And also, you know, we are sad that our Finding Your Person program registration has closed, but we are excited for all the people that joined. And hopefully we'll have another opening in a couple months. We like to do this, you know, when we can be fully attuned and helpful to everyone. So thanks again for everyone that joined and we'll see you in the program. For everyone else, you can always get on the waiting list. Still open and you'll be first to know when program reopens. So just go to findingyourperson.com. Perfect. And at Dateable Podcast, that's where we are on Instagram. You know, even though the season has already opened, there is a really fun season opener video. So if you haven't seen that yet, go to Instagram, you could see it. And yeah, I think that's all for announcements. You know, always I'll give a last plug. Leave us a rating and review. We're really trying to get to 1K and we're almost there. Not quite, but we're going to get there soon. So your review will help, especially if you leave five stars. And if you don't want to write anything, that's okay. Just hit the five stars. That's totally fine, too. (laughs) Still counts. Okay, well, before we get into it, let's hear a message from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by the One Love Foundation. The numbers of people affected by relationship abuse are startling. Abusive relationships rarely start with physical abuse. Instead, there are often red flags like manipulation, isolation, belittling, and volatility. Do you know the signs? One Love Foundation, a national nonprofit dedicated to ending relationship abuse, empowers you to see the signs of an unhealthy relationship before things go too far. Visit joinonelove.org and learn to spot the signs of unhealthy and healthy relationship behaviors. Okay, let's hear it from Vanessa and Xander. Sex. One of our favorite topics. Sex, sex, (laughs) sex. But we also want to know what happens behind closed doors for couples. It's something that over brunch, maybe your friends don't really bring up like what their (laughs) sex life is like. But it's something that is always top of mind, especially if you're new in a relationship or even 10 years into a relationship. The topic of sex always comes up. So we got a sexpert couple with us today, Vanessa and Xander Marin. Vanessa is a sex therapist with 20 years of experience. And Xander is just a regular dude. I love that that's how you introduce (laughs) 
yourself on the show. Just a regular dude, but you're really not. You're not just a regular dude. You're the host of Pillow Talks podcast and authors of the book Sex Talks. I'm holding it right now. That just came out and it's a number one new release on Amazon in the sex and sexuality category. Congratulations on that as I'm holding your labor Thank of you. love here. They're both in their late 30s. They live in Santa Barbara, originally from California, and they are married to each other, just want to clarify. Welcome, <laughs> Vanessa and Xander. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. We're so excited to be here. So congratulations on the book and congratulations on the podcast as well. I feel like I intimately know both of you and I realize you <laughs> don't know me. So you probably have so many of these people who've been hearing all about your intimate details. But uh-huh. I had this burning <laughs> question this whole time is, Xander, when did you know that Vanessa was a sex therapist? At what point? Was this information divulged? Well, I think that I knew from pretty much the very beginning. When we met, Vanessa hadn't gone to grad school yet for psychotherapy, so she wasn't practicing, but it was her career aspiration. And I probably found that out first date, I'm going to guess. I'm sure we talked about that. (laughs) So yeah, I always knew that was something that she wanted to do. Yeah, it wasn't until maybe four or five years into our relationship that she really started practicing Mm -hmm. that on a daily basis. But yeah, it was always an exciting thing. Like, it's cool to be able to tell my friends that I'm dating a future sex therapist. But be honest, it, it made you a little nervous too, right? Yeah, that's what yeah. I wanted to know. Yeah. That's what I yeah. wanted to know. Was there an intimidation <laughs> yes. factor it's at all? <laughs> Vanessa beat me to the butt. The butt was <laughs> that it was intimidating because I was like, it's fun to talk about sex that other couples are having or mm-hmm. issues that other people are having. But I kind of always knew like at some point I was going to have to get honest about my own stuff. I was mm-hmm. going to have to confront my own issues or our own issues. And that was scary at first. I can only imagine. I'm intimidated talking to Vanessa and I'm not even having sex with Vanessa. (laughs) And then Vanessa, for you, when you started your research and your studies and then practicing, did you have any of your personal rules around sex? Because I know you two had sex on your second or third date. Debatable. Which one? I know there was a debate about that. (laughs) But quite early on in your relationship, did you have any of those rules that so many of us have? I tried not to have any hard and fast rules about my sex life. I just found that each situation was so unique. Each relationship was so unique that if I went into it with these rules that I felt like I had to adhere to, it was actually harder for me to tune into myself and what my needs felt like in those situations. So in general, I'm not a big fan of rules that we have to stick by. (laughs) And I definitely didn't go into our first date with any rules in mind. Honestly, I was not looking for a serious relationship. I wasn't expecting to fall into a serious relationship. And so it was really just more of a let's see what happens kind of thing. And very quickly, I very (laughs) visibly saw that it was more than just a let's see what happens situation. (laughs) Like we were pretty well matched and it turned very quickly into a very serious relationship. Interesting. Like, do you remember what that like moment was that you said, okay, like this is more? It really just felt like it was those some of those early days. So one of the things that I appreciated so much about Xander is that there wasn't this sense of playing games with each other. And I think that's very Mm. often what the rules end Mm. up feeling like in the moment is it feels like playing games. So that night that we met, we had this furious makeout session. We were up (laughs) for hours. He walked me home at the end of the night and he just said, I want to see you. What are you doing tomorrow? And it felt so exciting to me to have, here's somebody who's not trying to do this whole thing of the rules of, oh, I've got to play it cool and wait a couple of days to call her. We ended up being way too tired and a little hungover to (laughs) hang out the next day. But it was just so refreshing to hear him say like, I like you. I want to see you again. When can I see you next? So we went out on our first date the night after. Yeah. Two days. First (laughs) official date. Yes. As quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. We met on a Saturday and we had dates Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And it just felt like I appreciate that he wants to see me. He's making that time to see me. And that's, I think, what helped move the relationship forward so quickly. Both of us were just like, we like each other. We want to keep hanging out. Why should we play any games and pretend that we don't? Why is it that difficult and not easy? But as we know, you know, sex, I feel like is one of those things you think is supposed to be easy, but it's not always. 
which is why you wrote this book, why you have the podcast, (laughs) why you do the work that you do. I guess like I'm curious. We always wonder like what goes on behind closed doors. And like you you were saying earlier, like at brunch, you don't talk about sex, especially when it's not going well. What are some of the things you've heard like as the most common challenges that couples face with sex? Yeah, we are just not having these open conversations, even Mm -hmm. with our friends. You know, if we do talk about sex, I think a lot of us feel this desire to make it seem like it's perfect, especially once we get into a relationship. So it's one thing when you're dating someone casually, you might say like, oh, yeah, it was really good or it was not good. We might go into more details about what happened. But once you're in a relationship with somebody and you want your friends to like them, you want them to think that the relationship is going well and everything's good – We don't want to give those sensitive details anymore. So we hear from so many people who tell us, I am not even honest with my closest friends about what's really going on in our bedroom. So the biggest complaints that we hear about from people are feeling low desire, and that goes really hand in hand with feeling like there's mismatched libidos in the relationship. Like I want it way less than my partner wants it. We're like arguing about how frequently we should have it. And then on men's behalf, we hear a lot about performance anxiety. Mm. I'm struggling to get hard, stay hard, have an orgasm at the right time, generally feeling anxious about sex. And pretty similarly for women, we hear that same anxiety about, am I good? Is my partner enjoying it? And a lot of women having problems with orgasm specifically. Am I taking too long? mm -hmm. Mm. Women who have never had an orgasm or maybe they can get there on their own but really struggle to get there with a partner. So those would be the top three things that we hear about. Sounds about right. And I feel like all of that it's a very lonely place to be when you think there may be something wrong in your sex life and you have nobody to talk to about it. And I think a lot of times with our friends too, you feel like the default of a healthy relationship is a healthy sex life. You just assume people definitely are just yeah. banging all the time because they <laughs> uh-huh. look so happy. It must be so great. And I recently had a conversation with a girlfriend of mine who has a very high sex drive and she's like, my goal is twice a week. And I'm like, that is so achievable. I did not know that was your goal. I thought she was like twice a day, you know? So we have all these misconceptions about people. Why do you think talking about sex would help alleviate some of these problems? We all build up these stories in our heads of what everybody else's sex lives look like and what our sex lives are supposed to look like. And if we don't talk about those stories openly, especially with the person that we are having sex with, then it's so likely that there's going to be miscommunication, misunderstanding about what we actually need and want. So for example, like if Xander and I never talk about how often do we want to be having sex, what feels good in our relationship, we could very easily misunderstand each other. Maybe he thinks like you, like, oh, we're supposed to be doing it twice a day and that stresses him (laughs) out and feels like way too much. But I'm over here thinking, oh, like twice a week would sound totally great to me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the example you gave was such a good example where you had a limited amount of information. You know that this friend of yours has a higher sex drive or maybe she's mentioned like, oh, I have a pretty high sex drive. And then Mm -hmm. you it turns into a story in your mind. And the same thing happens with us. Like in a lot of partnerships, you might not talk about sex very much, but you probably have an idea of like, oh yeah, I think my partner has a higher sex drive than I do, or they've mentioned that they have a high sex drive, but that's all of the conversation you have. And it's going to be so easy to jump to this conclusion of it's not going to be good enough unless they're getting it every day or twice a day, when in reality, maybe they want it once a week. And it can also be other aspects of your sex life too. Maybe there's this move that your partner thinks you love and it works so well <laughs> yes. for you. And you're over here thinking, you're like, please oh, stop. <laughs> Again, I hate it. Not the boob honk again. (laughs) Oh, yes. So the two of you, I think your story is really fascinating. Kind of, you know, you've been together a while. You've gone through periods where maybe there wasn't as much sex as you would have hoped. Could you share a little bit about your own story and how that's fed into the work you do? So it was hot and heavy between the two of us when we first met, Mm -hmm. those back-to-back dates. We were really into each other. And then we went through what pretty much every relationship goes through. You've been together for a little while. You start getting more comfortable with each other. Life starts catching up to you, and you start having less and less sex. So we share our story in the book, and we say there's nothing remarkable about what happened to us, nothing completely out of the ordinary. It's something that we all 
all go through. We hit that period in a relationship where it just starts feeling harder and more complicated. And so for us, it did feel like this huge stumbling block of, wow, it it used to feel so easy at the beginning. (laughs) And now it's feeling so hard. And even though I was already on this career path, pursuing sex therapy, I was looking for resources and just feeling like there was nothing out there. So it was this sense of exactly what you were saying before you have like feeling alone in it, feeling like, oh my gosh, we must be the only couple that are going through this. And this added little imposter syndrome for me oh, of yeah. I'm yes. studying to do I'm this to and be I an expert figure here, it out right? my own relationship. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yep. and, and for me as a guy, there was this like, well, I'm a man. I'm supposed right. to want sex all the time. Right. How can this be a problem when it feels like everything else in our relationship is right? Like, how is it that I am mm-hmm. not wanting it enough? Is there something wrong with me as a man? Like, I immediately jumped to like, oh, like there must be something wrong with my hormone levels or my mm-hmm. testosterone mm-hmm. or whatever it is. But that kept me from looking at all the other things going on. Like, how is my fitness? How is my emotional well being? How is my workload? Like, I was working myself to the bone at, you know, 23, mm. 24 years old, trying to get ahead, not doing any exercise, really not feeling very good about myself at all. And then, like, the little time I did have off of work was like at home, lying on the couch with Vanessa. And it's like, that just wasn't a good situation yeah. for, for me to feel very fired up with my sex drive. So is there a time, because like I'm thinking the honeymoon period, right, is when you're hot and heavy. And I've seen it in my relationship too. It's like you get comfortable with each other and yeah. you don't need to prove it as much. So like the whole thing, is there a set time or is it really like very couple to couple. The honeymoon period will typically last for about six to 12 months, sometimes up to two years. But even neurochemically, like the neurotransmitters that are being released in our brains when we're meeting a new person, falling in love with them, those can only last for about six to 12 months. So it's not just that life gets more complicated and, you know, all these other factors come into play. It's also like our brains are not physically capable of maintaining that level of intensity for longer than a year max. Interesting. That makes a lot of sense. I used to just blame it on life happening, which you're saying it is a contributor to all of it, but we're just also not built to be hot and heavy mm-hmm. forever. That's good because mm-hmm. then we'd be exhausted. So that's good to know. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> it's like you need to do other stuff than just fuck, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but then at what point in your sex life is it a problem? It's different for every couple. I mean, some couples will get into that slowdown and feel like, okay, this just feels like the natural progression. We're all right with this. For us, it felt like a pretty sudden and intense change and it didn't feel healthy. It didn't feel normal. So for us, it did feel like a problem. Yeah. I mean, it really felt like a big elephant in the room. Like, I think (laughs) Mm -hmm. that that's kind of a good barometer. Like, does it feel like there's a lot going unspoken between you? Is there this kind of big awkward thing where it's like we kind of know this is an issue but we don't want to acknowledge it and that was absolutely what was going on for the two of us but yeah I mean there are like Vanessa said there's plenty of couples where it's like okay yeah those first couple months were exhausting and now we're (laughs) we're ready to slow down (laughs) and we're totally happy with that like if that happens that's great. Like you guys are on the same page. I mean, it's good still to be able to acknowledge that, hey, are we both still feeling on the same page about, you know, the way that things are, you know, we're easing into a new pattern. Mm. Um, And as long as you're cool with that, then awesome. Like you're on the same page. But yeah, for us, you know, we were struggling to have conversations about whether we were on the same page and doing so it was pretty clear that we weren't on the same page. So how long did you kind of dance around this until you decided to talk about it. It took months. And, you know, I was the one who was wanting to talk about it more. I was wanting us to go to therapy and try to figure out what to do. And Xander was really hesitant. Mm -hmm. He wasn't ready. And so that's something that we talk about in the book, acknowledging that couples are always going to be on different timelines with this. It would be great if, you know, Mm -hmm. one person could say, hey, can we go to therapy? And the other person's like, I'm right there with you. Let's do it. But that's just so rare. So we've been through that of what it was like to have one partner wanting to work on it and the other not and yeah wanted to give resources for couples who are in that same situation and then how did it finally happen how did the conversations start flowing 
I kept telling Xander that I wanted to go to therapy. And so eventually it took a couple of months, to be honest, and it was a painful period of time for us. But we did end up going to therapy. And to be totally honest with you, like it was fine. We got like a few (laughs) resources and a few tools and it ended up being like just enough to get the ball rolling for us. But we realized through many, many years of like continuing to have these conversations and building up this business together, we started to realize, ah, there's got to be a better way (laughs) to it. We need more resources about how to have these conversations. Oh, yeah, because I mean, one of those reasons is that typically, you know, a couple goes to a marriage and family therapist and, you know, you assume like marriage and family therapist, like sex has got to be a normal topic. But the the reality is, is, I mean, like how much education in sex did you have to get to get your MFT? Yeah, to become licensed as a therapist, I had to do a one unit class That's on it. human sexuality, where basically all we did was learn the proper anatomical <laughs> names for things. That's a penis. That's a vagina. Great. Wow. You passed your one unit class. Yeah. So, so <laughs> unfortunately, you know, so we learned that, oh, yeah, most therapists themselves are not super comfortable talking about mm-hmm. this because mm-hmm. there aren't a lot of resources out there. Yeah. And that's, you know, in, therapists you know, are humans, too. In Partially yeah. the inspiration for us doing what we're doing. We've talked about this before in podcast episodes that like even in 2023, we still can't talk about sex. Like for whatever reason, it's still taboo. Like, I guess what made you decide to talk to someone, a therapist, like go down that route versus try on your own to have those conversations? Was it just going in circles? Did you not know where to start? Like, what did that look like? Yeah, I I started initiating those conversations and it just went in circles because I was asking like what I can see now is I was asking the wrong questions. I was Mm -hmm. asking things like, why don't you ever want to have sex with me? Why aren't we Mm -hmm. having sex very often? And Mm -hmm. those kinds of questions, obviously, you know, just put him Mm -hmm. on the defensive, make him feel like he's the problem. There's something that he needs to fix about himself, which of course felt very scary and and made you want to shut down and not want to talk about it more. So I tried myself and then realized this isn't going anywhere. And as somebody who was training to be a therapist, I thought, okay, let's see if therapy can be a, a better model. But yeah, it was still a struggle for us. Yeah. And I think in therapy, our therapist was able to help us try to look at it as more of a team effort that was Mm -hmm. going to be required that it's not just when this is happening it's it's never just one person's problem that they need to fix and it's really easy for us to get into that headspace Mm -hmm. where it's like hey i'm not the problem you're the problem right go fix the problem and then (sighs) we'll be good but that's not what a partnership (laughs) is all about like Mm -hmm. a partnership it's a partnership (laughs) like you have to do things together and so it was really helpful for us to have that reframe of Mm -hmm. okay this is something that both of us can work on. It's not just a matter of like, oh, I want sex less than she does right now in this season of life. And I just need to find a way to, you know, boost that desire. Well, I feel like this is such an essential conversation because the reframe is what will get us out of this guilt mindset. Like I'm the one with less sexual desire. I feel so guilty about that. I should really find ways to be more sexually active. But I thought this was so fascinating. 73% of your Instagram audience said that they wanted higher sex drive, but then very few of them wanted to do something about it. (laughs) And when you ask, why do you want a higher sex drive? Most people were saying that they wanted to please their partner or they want to bring up their sex drive so that they can be the equal level. There was a lot of just guilt and responsibility tied to it. Can you give us more of these learnings? Because I was like, this is eye opening. Damn. (laughs) <laughs> we're taught to believe that the higher the sex drive, the better, the more sex we're having, the better. And definitely, if you feel like there's a mismatch in your relationship, the person with the lower sex drive very often blames themselves. It's my fault. And so we always like to say there is no one correct sex drive that everybody should be having. And it's really important for us to dig deeper into this. It's easy to say, yeah, I want to have a higher sex drive. You know, there are so many things in life that we would want if we could just snap our fingers and get it. But we want to dig deeper and identify what are the actual root causes that are going on. So with sex drive, there are so many factors that can affect it. And we need to have that curiosity about it. So here's one great example. 
our desire for sex is very heavily tied into our enjoyment of sex. And this is something that so many people do not connect until they hear it laid out like that. Like if you're having sex that feels Mm. routine, kind of predictable, if it feels like it's more about your partner's pleasure than Mm. for you, there's very little in it for you, why would you crave that experience? Right. So if you look at couples who have a mismatch in desire, very often what is at the root of the issue is that there's a mismatch in the level of pleasure that they're getting from the sex they're having. And no one wants to ever say that. It's just the other person's problem, right? Uh Exactly. So yeah, so that is, of course, a sensitive conversation. A lot of people then leap ahead to, oh my God, now I have to go tell my partner, like, you suck at sex and you need to get better. (laughs) (laughs) Like, that is not our advice. Don't worry. (laughs) There's plenty of ways. That's why the whole fourth conversation in sex talks is all about pleasure. We wanted to give exercise and frameworks for couples to explore what brings them pleasure and talk about it in ways that feel fun and exciting rather than critical. I think one of the big problems, though, is that, you know, everyone wants to know, like, okay, well, like, what do we do if our desires are mismatched? And so then we start talking about the desire enjoyment connection. And then you quickly understand and go, okay, I see what's going on, but this is way too complicated of a conversation Mm. to have. And so, I mean, that's one of the big reasons why we wrote this book because we were like, okay, these are really important conversations to have, but these can't be the first conversations that you have. That's way too hard. And so we try to back it way, way up (laughs) in our book and start with really, really simple things like just simply acknowledging that, hey, sex is a thing and we have it. Let's start talking positively about sex. Let's talk about the fact that it's something that we do. Let's give each other some simple, basic compliments about sex just so that we start feeling more comfortable with sex as like an everyday topic of conversation. And so that way, sex becomes a safe topic. And then we can start building on those conversations until we can get to that pleasure conversation and really kind of get to, you know, the meat or the heart of it. (laughs) So I want to go through that because that's Mm -hmm. the core of your book, right? And I know, Vanessa, you said that when you first had the conversation, you asked all the wrong things and you went about it in not the best way. (laughs) So clearly these five essential talks that you're putting out there in the book, is what you learned from that experience and all your work. Can you kind of walk us through the five and why they're so important? Yeah, so we came up with the five conversations that we think every couple needs to have in order to have extraordinary sex. And we laid them out in a really specific order that we think is going to be the most approachable and the most fun. So in the book, we start with acknowledgement. Sex is a thing. We have it. We're getting comfortable with it as a topic of conversation. Then we move into connection. What do we need to feel emotionally connected to each other throughout the day so that we feel that openness to be intimate with each other? Next is desire. What do we each need to feel turned on, to feel excited Mm -hmm. about being intimate? Then we have pleasure. What do we need to enjoy the experience to make sure it's satisfactory for both of us? And then finally, we have exploration. What do we want to try next? Oh, I like that because it's <laughs> it progresses. Uh huh. Exactly um, to the next time, which is very nice because you have something to look forward to. So I'm getting this right. First, you set the foundation, creating a safe space to talk about sex, which I think is a step many couples miss. I've yeah. certainly missed that in previous relationships. It's almost like you go straight into what are your fetishes? Yeah. Yeah. What are your kinks? Yeah. What are you into? You want to do this upside down? You want to try this new toy? Yeah. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's go to step one. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about the sex that we're having first. And then you start building upon that with how do we start talking about having sex with each other? Then how do we start wanting to have sex with each other? And how do we make it the best sexual experience possible so that we Mm. keep wanting more? So you just keep building and building and building. I really love that. I understand acknowledgement, talking about sex is a thing. What are the ways that couples can connect better with each other as a second step? Yeah, I love that you gave that example because that is a big issue that a lot of couples come up against is that we jump right into the deep end Mm -hmm. with the what's your fantasy and what's your kinks, or we wait until there's a really big problem with our sex life. And just Mm -hmm. like I went into it with Xander, why are we not doing this? Why don't you want me? And it only makes sex feel like this dangerous and, you know, unsafe conversation to Mm -hmm. have or not a fun one, certainly. Mm -hmm. So that's why we start with acknowledgement. And then we move 
into emotional connection next because a lot of us have this tendency to compartmentalize our sex life. We think of sex as like, that's just that thing that we do in the bedroom at night. We don't need to talk about it. But the reality is that our desire for sex is very highly tied into how connected we feel to our partner on a day-to-day basis. And especially in long-term relationships, so many couples tell us, We feel like we've moved more into roommates rather than romantic partners. Mm. We don't spend very much quality time together. We're kind of like two ships passing in the night. So if you're feeling so disconnected from your partner, the idea of leaping into having sex with them feels very jarring. It feels kind of scary even sometimes. We're so disconnected. Why would I want to go to that maximum level of connection? So we wanted to help couples come up with very practical and easy ways to keep that connection going throughout the day. So not only are you going to feel more open to having sex, but your relationship is just also going to feel better too. I think one of the things that's interesting that you said is that we put sex in like its own corner and don't think about it. We do this podcast about modern dating and a lot of people that aren't in relationships, like they're thinking there's so many other hurdles I have to get over to find a partner. And now I have to worry about like sex not being good too. (laughs) And I can hear people saying that. And I think that's why a lot of times we avoid it. I think also like avoid the conversation because it's challenging. But like, why do you think it is so important to have these talks when things haven't gotten to the place of just like really bad? (laughs) You're coming now from like a place of defensiveness. You're gonna get to a tough point with your sex life at some point in your relationship. It's pretty inevitable. Every couple has some sort of hang up. And if we don't have that foundation of talking about sex from the earlier parts of a relationship, it's going to be so much harder to have those tough conversations when they do come up. And not only that, but the point that we really want to make in the book is that talking about sex can be fun. It can Mm -hmm. feel very sexy. It can feel flirtatious. It can bring back Mm -hmm. that feeling of the butterflies that we miss from those early stages of our relationship. So it's not that it's this thing that we all have to work on and, okay, I'm going to talk about sex (laughs) just like I'm going to brush my teeth twice a day and make sure I'm flossing, but it's actually an enjoyable intimacy building experience. And I also think like if you are in the very early stages of a relationship or if you're dating, um, picking up this book and getting an understanding of what these conversations are, the way that we have it laid out at the beginning, they're very easy and approachable conversations that you could just very casually slip into conversation. It's a great way as you're getting to know them in terms of like, what are their interests? What are they into? Do our values align? You can also kind of be gauging like, do our, do our, does our sexual compatibility align? And as you weave those conversations into getting to know someone, like you are already setting that foundation without ever needing to have that, Hey, we got to sit down and we got to figure out this sex thing. Like you're just going to be setting yourself up. (laughs) for success from the very beginning. Yeah, it just becomes part of your normal conversation. You don't need to set time just for that. What do you think about scheduling sex? Is that (laughs) the ultimate libido killer? (laughs) That's always a big question. People want to know. (laughs) So we are fans of scheduling sex. Okay. As long as you do it the right way. Because there is definitely many wrong ways to do it that can probably be more harmful to your relationship than good. A lot of us think about scheduling sex and we imagine, you know, we have to put it in our calendar. We're making, we're signing a contract, this guarantee that we're going to do it. And we feel this sense of dread around it. Like, oh God, Wednesday's coming. I'm going to have to do it. (laughs) So if you schedule it that way, that is not going to be fun. And, you know, having sex, forcing yourself to have sex to meet some sort of quota, that's not going to be fun. But I think scheduling can be done in a very different sort of way. So I love to walk people back to thinking about the early stages in your relationship. So Xander and I met on a Saturday. What did we do? We scheduled a date for Monday. Right. We tried to schedule a date for Sunday. Didn't work out. <laughs> so we scheduled a real one for Monday. We scheduled a date for Wednesday. We scheduled a date for Friday. Once we started having sex with each other, there was a pretty clear understanding that when we were scheduling a date, like mm. sex was going to happen oh, on that. Yeah. And when I was back in those times, like, 
I was excited about that scheduled time. I was looking forward to it. I was anticipating it. I was getting myself all worked up to, I'm going to see him tonight. And so it's the same sort of thing. We were scheduling time together. So it's not that all of a sudden now it takes so much more effort to be intimate, but it's that our attitude about that effort has changed. So if we can think about having fun scheduling it, that can make all the difference in the world. And one super practical thing that people could do right away with this is change the word. A lot of us don't like schedule. It does just yeah. make people our to-do list. <laughs> it does so, sound bad. Say it's a date night. You're going to have a date night instead. Or maybe there's some sort of cute inside joke between the two of you that you can say like, it's our you know special bu- 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 day. Our 360 review. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that we just sounds like, real sexy. <laughs> <laughs> we love encouraging people to plan for intimacy because the reality is our lives are busy. Yeah. And if we don't make a plan for something, it's likely not going to happen. And most of us are really prioritizing work and chores and other responsibilities over quality time with our partner. Yeah. So if we can take that approach of, you're just as important mm-hmm. to me as the other appointments that I have on my calendar. I want to carve out time to be with you. Then that's going to have a totally different vibe to it. And another really good word swap is you can say, let's schedule or let's plan intimacy rather than Mm. sex. Mm. Because I think when you use the word sex, especially in male-female relationships, we tend to assume that sex means intercourse, which can feel like, you know, a lot to commit to, or it can feel like a high bar. We always like to say that, you know, we we think sex can really be any type of intimate activity. There's Mm -hmm. no definition of, oh, sex has to be intercourse. So, you know, when Vanessa and I say schedule sex, we're meaning scheduling any type of physical intimacy, Mm. but it can be really helpful for, you know, you to break whatever association you have with that to say, let's schedule intimacy. Let's have an intimacy date. And that way you're not thinking, oh, I like, I have to perform. I have to, Mm -hmm. I have to commit to this. I have to guarantee this. Mm. I really like that because like I'm two years in with my partner and I can already see it's like it's not like even take sex aside but just even scheduling time it's like in the week we'll just like watch TV and I'll be doing work and you know it just then you fall asleep on the couch it just makes it so easy (laughs) to not have anything because you're just so comfortable but we've actually talked about scheduling like okay Tuesday will be the day that we're like doing a date night even if we don't leave the house so this is the same idea. And I really like that. I think it resonates a lot. Yeah, for too many of us, our quality time has turned into we're both on our phones scrolling yeah, through Instagram yeah. and TikTok while we're watching Netflix and nobody's paying attention to anything and certainly not to each other. Yes. So we think it's very important for couples to be intentional about spending quality time together. It's just so easy for us to get sucked into the couch routine. Totally. But we need Absolutely. to have those moments that feel special and that remind us of why we fell in love with each other in the first place. And we didn't fall in love. You know, those the Monday, Wednesday, Friday dates, those were not sit on the couch watching Netflix. No, no. Like we fell in love because we were doing fun stuff together. That's when you want to have sex, right? Not Uh when you're like half asleep on the couch. You're like Uh barely checking your phones because you're so busy enjoying each other and discovering each other. Before we keep going on this topic, let's take a quick break. This episode is sponsored by Via. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom, but did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes, Via has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow, it will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the High Love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Via also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATEABLE at ViaHemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head 
to viahemp.com and use a code DATABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's viahemp.com and use a code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. Living with ADHD can be a challenge and dating with ADHD is definitely a challenge, we've heard many of you say, but finding the right care and proper tools needed to succeed can be life-changing. Done is an online ADHD care platform that can get you all the resources you need to help manage your ADHD. Online visits, refills, and a 24-7 care team made for you. In just one minute, Done's online assessment can help kickstart your ADHD treatment journey. With experienced clinicians, worry-fill refills, and online visits, you can start getting personalized care as soon as today or tomorrow. So contact an expert team that can help you around the clock and get a personalized treatment plan just for you. Here's how you do it. Take a free one-minute assessment and book an appointment with a licensed ADHD clinician as soon as the next day. Get continuous care, one-click refills, insurance coverage, and 24-7 care team support with Done for just $79 a month. And pharmacy co-pays as low as $0. Visit get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. That's get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. Done. Turn ADHD into your strength. This episode is made possible by Armoire. Armoire makes getting dressed easy. With a clothing rental membership from Armoire, build the perfect wardrobe with brands that are high quality, unique, and recommended just for you. All you have to do is take a five-minute style quiz and select items from your dynamic, personalized closet. The styles show up at your door in as little as two days. Then when you're ready for new clothes, just swap them out. Listen, I live in Southern California. There is absolutely no need for puffer coats or any sort of those winter jackets. But when I travel anywhere else in the world in these cold months, I'm often burdened with the task of getting winter clothes. And now with Armoire, I can just rent my winter wardrobe. It's brilliant. Right now, our listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.com style slash datable. That is armoire.style spelled A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Try armoire today. You mentioned that there's always going to be mismatched sex drive in a partnership. So someone's always technically getting rejected, Mm -hmm. right? Quote, unquote, someone's saying, no, I'm too tired on this. How do you advise couples like the person on the receiving end? How would someone handle rejection? How should rejection be done differently? Our favorite tip for this is that when you are turning your partner down for sex, to give them a specific reason and tie that into how you would like to show up Mm. during sex with them. So we've all heard like, oh, I'm too tired, I have a headache, and that feels kind of like a fake excuse, right? (laughs) But if I were to say to Xander, like, I appreciate that you initiated, I am so exhausted from this day that I'm just worried that I'm not going to be able to be present with you in the way that I really want to be so that we can have fun and have a great experience could we try again tomorrow or something Mm -hmm. like that? Like when I tie it to, I'm not going to be able to show up in the way that I want it to, I'm making it really clear to him that it's about having an enjoyable experience, not just about like, oh, I have a headache and I don't want to. And then like a bonus thing you can do on top of that, if you're open to it, is offer something different. Like Mm. I'm not up for sex. I'm not up for intercourse or whatever it is that's being initiated. I'm not up for that, but I would like to feel some connection with you because the reality is we have sex to feel connected with each other. So, yeah. you know, would you be open to we snuggle on the couch for a couple of yeah, minutes I love that. before bed or we go on a walk together? Because I think that the rejection, it can kind of be a double whammy because it's like, okay, they're turning me down for sex and then it's awkward and like <laughs> we don't have any opportunity for yeah. connection. So it's like I'm being turned yeah. down for sex and connection. And so, yeah, can can we Mm -hmm. pivot that into, hey, here's why I'm not up for it. It has nothing to do with you. 
how about we do, you know, something else that's going to feel good? Maybe it won't feel as good, but it will feel a <laughs> hell of a lot better than sitting there awkward and like, oh, I guess I'm just going to go back to my phone. <laughs> yeah. I think that's so key, though. It's kind of like actually reminds me of early dating, right? When someone has to cancel, when you offer that next day yeah. to do something or an alternative, it's such a better outcome than just being like, oh, yeah, I need to reschedule and then just never doing anything. So another practical tip tip that people can do that we've done this in our own relationship is if one of us is going to say no to sex, then we sort of have this agreement that if I say no, I've got like 48 hours to initiate sex with Xander I like again. Oh, so it doesn't okay. have to be like a, you know, a commitment. I'm not going to get in trouble if I don't do That's it. That's good. But it's this recognition that, hey, Xander initiated and I said no. He was vulnerable. He's now having to deal with a little bit of feeling of rejection. Mm. And so I'm going to show him you're important to me. Our sex life is important to me. I'm going to take on that role of being vulnerable and initiating something with you and reminding you that sex is important to me too. Well, that's lovely because then you're saying not today, but I still <laughs> want to be intimate with you and I still want to be yeah. enjoy this experience with you. So I like this offering up this other alternative. You could be like, not today, but do you want to get choked? Like, is that an option? <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> I know a few friends who are in very low sex drive relationships and they're constantly kind of like asking me, do you think it's because they have the same sex drive with their partner, which is no sex drive or low sex drive. They ask me, like, do you think there's a problem? But they don't feel like it's a problem in their relationship. I don't think there's any one amount of sex that we should all be having. If that couple feels like, yeah, we're happy with having it infrequently or we're in a season of life where we're, it's just not a big priority to us, as long as that couple is communicating with each other and they're both on board with it, I think that's totally fine. That just That is a part of life sometimes. So I think the key is to make sure that you're having that conversation repeatedly. Yeah. So maybe it's let's check in again in six months and see if anything has changed. Yeah, I think the mistake a lot of couples make is, you know, they might check in at one point in time, mm. let's say they're both right. in a really busy season of life. And it's like, okay, cool. Like, we're both cool with this. But then six months later, one partner just assumes, okay, yeah, we're just continuing on like that. And the other right. partner's like, hey, I'm feeling different. <laughs> but like, what right. do we do? And it's those moments where we're not communicating about it or not acknowledging it, that it's so easy to start creating stories in our mind of like, oh, well, they must not be into me anymore more. Right. There must be something wrong. Whereas the other partner's just like, hey, we talked about this. I thought we were good. Well, that's why sex is such like the barometer for so much more, right? And there's so much like of our own personal ties to it and self-worth. How do you go about actually having these conversations like yeah. logistically? Like, do you do this like after sex, before sex, <laughs> in the middle of the afternoon when sex is not on the table? Like, what's the logistics look like? In each of the conversations in sex talks, we talk specifically about when and how to have that conversation. We want it to be really clear for people because it is very different. So something for the acknowledgement conversation, you can have those kinds of conversations really at any time. And like for Xander and I, this has turned into flirting for us. So we'll bring up sex at a random time during the day. We'll make like a little sex joke or an innuendo. We'll recall a favorite memory. And it just feels like this way that we keep that tension alive between the two of us. But let's contrast that with something like pleasure. If you want to talk to your partner about something that you're wanting differently in the bedroom, then that's a conversation we recommend having outside of the bedroom, mm. completely separate from when you've had sex, because it is so easy for a partner to take that personally. So if you were to just have sex and then you're telling your partner, you know, actually, I don't love that move that you're <laughs> you're doing, you know, right. your partner's going to be more sensitive to it. So that one is a yeah different time. What about, you know, we can talk about sex, but there's also sexual talking, like dirty talk. Yeah. How can couples introduce dirty talk into their sex lives? And like, do you talk about, do you want that yeah, first do you, like, or yeah, do you just do, you, do it? What is dirty talk to you and what words are uh, off Yeah, limits? that fits into conversation five, exploration. <laughs> so we have this great exercise in the chapter that gives you this huge list. It's like a sexual bucket list of all, like not all, but a huge list of things that you could try in the bedroom. And it's this really fun exercise where you get to fill it out separately and then talk to each other and compare your answers. So dirty talk is on that list. 
list. So the list is just a great way to kind of, you get to have these conversations, but you're sort of blaming it on the book. You're like, yeah, we're just doing, we did this exercise. This now we have to, to do to it. download yeah. about it. So that's a great opportunity to check in with each other about is Dirty Talk something you like? Do you want to do a little bit more of it? Should we explore it? In terms of Dirty Talk, we actually have a Dirty Talk 101 guide mm-hmm. that we sell because I think Dirty Talk is a very misunderstood thing. I, some people do it without any issues. It comes very natural to them. But I think a lot of us get really in our heads about Dirty Talk. We have an idea yeah. that it's supposed to be a certain way. There's only these very specific words that we say. We have to sound like a porn star or yeah. whatever it is. And the reality <laughs> is, is that Dirty Talk, it can be totally unique to you. Like you have your own voice, your own words that you, you know, certain words that you like, certain words that you don't like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and what we do in that guide is we really guide people through identifying your own authentic dirty talk voice and figuring out, okay, I like these words for these body parts. I don't like these words for these body parts. Here are ways that I can start stringing these together so that it doesn't feel like, oh, I just have to show up as this totally different person. Like it should be something that's totally authentic to you and just a natural part of the experience rather than a, oh, tonight we're doing dirty talk, but tomorrow (laughs) we're not. I feel like I need your guide because I feel like I'm always super awkward and I feel like I'm saying things that don't feel like true to myself. So I will get that guide. Perfect. I've never dirty talked and not laughed after. It just no, feels exactly. so silly it feels to me. Forced. We have exercises in okay. the guide for how to you get have it all. You have it all. We've got it all. Yeah, we just love like breaking down the parts of sex that we all feel like we should be good at already yeah. and just showing you like, it's okay. We've got tons <laughs> of fun tips and techniques and we'll, we'll guide you through it all. So a lot of our listeners, you know, aren't in relationships. And I love what you said earlier, Xander, that, you know, this can be a way to learn more about your compatibility by having these conversations. I feel like, though, it can be a little tricky sometimes with someone that you don't know well of like, how do you even broach this in a way that they're gonna feel like you're not just like looking to hook up and that's all you want? Or basically, what's a way that makes them receptive when you don't really know how they operate fully? I got a great first question for you. You can just ask that person how do you feel talking about sex? Mm. How comfortable do you feel talking about sex? So you're not bringing up some like, tell me your kinkiest fantasy. <laughs> where the person's like, dude, we're on our first date. date. One, like, yeah. love. <laughs> but if you did it in that voice, that'd be really yeah, hot. In the yeah, voice. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still like giving you this opportunity to talk about sex as a more general topic and see, you know, what comes up for that person. Another option could be like, tell me what your experience was like getting the talk from your parents. Mm, mm. I like that. I like that. It's going around it a little bit. It's not as a direct of a question, but it it's gives still... you an opportunity to bond over probably yeah, you're, you you're have awkward. very awkward experiences. Yeah, sex ed. You could talk but about yeah, sex ed. Yeah, but it might ed. give you that sense of maybe the person says it was so awkward, but you know, I've put a lot of work into becoming more comfortable talking about it myself, or I realized I want to have a very different kind of conversation with my future children or something like that. So it gives you a way to talk about sex without going into the logistical details of it yet. And I think if you were to ask that question of just like, how do you feel talking about sex, it allows you to then also bring up how you feel about having sex like relative to dating and how many dates you go on so that it's not this sort of like, you know, feeling each other out like, oh, okay, oh, is are we having a longer kiss? Right. Like, oh, do we do we go back right. upstairs now? Right. I don't know. You know do so they want to might... initiate me to initiate? Yeah, of course, it's going to feel awkward the first time you ask that question. But the more we lean into doing those awkward things, the less awkward they feel. And if you think about the outcome of that awkwardness, could be that you're able to really clearly state how you feel about sex in a new relationship and gauge how comfortable that person is, how sexually compatible you might be without there being this elephant in the room of like, (laughs) okay, how long are we waiting without ever talking about it? And on the opposite side of the spectrum for people who've been in long-term relationships, maybe like five plus years and never really talked about sex, how would you advise them to start this conversation? 
with that acknowledgement conversation. So Same. with sharing, starting to share some of their favorite sexual memories with each other so that you create that foundation of talking about it in a positive and neutral way. And I want to normalize, you know, we have talked to so many people who have said we've been together years decades and we've mm-hmm. never had a conversation about sex. So we want couples to know like, it's okay. We're still going to ease you into <laughs> it, but we still want to start on that positive note where we just start talking about some favorite memories together. Yeah. I mean, so here's what you could do right now. Like you could pull out your phone. You could think about what is your favorite sexual memory with your partner or just what's a really good memory that comes mm-hmm. up, write that down and just be like, hey, this memory just randomly came to mind. It made me smile. It made me think about you. Just wanted to let you know. I love that. And see what happens. (laughs) No matter what stage of a relationship, I think everyone should do that today. Like that's such a great way to bring it up. You're not making any complaints. You're not trying to solve anything. It's not a we need to talk kind of thing. (laughs) It's just giving your partner this experience of, oh, this can be fun and playful and we can talk about it openly without it having to be a problem or it's scary. And like they're thinking about me. Yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. Like, doesn't like that. Thinking about me. <laughs> I mean, this conversation has been so wonderful. Thank you both for being here. But I think like when we went into this conversation, I feel like there's this connotation, I guess this will lead me to my takeaways, is that we have to talk about sex when there's something wrong. Mm. And what I've gathered today here is that that is the furthest from the case, like the actual truth of when you should talk about sex. The other thing that really struck home for me on this conversation is we always talk about other parts of the relationship where we're not aligned, like when one person is ready to get engaged before the other or take a step into a relationship, move in together, whatever it may be. But we don't ever talk about like not being perfectly aligned with our sexual experience. And it's just another facet of the relationship. It's the same way that you would kind of go about, I like what you said earlier of like it's neither of our problems, it's us as a couple and something that we're working towards together. So even though it feels scary to talk about sex because it's so personal, how does it just become another aspect of your relationship that you're finding a middle ground in finding something that works for the two of you? So I think like that's definitely been my outcome of this conversation is that there's never too early of a time to talk about it and it doesn't have to be so scary. I'm so glad that that's the takeaway because that's exactly the takeaway (laughs) we want people to have when they read our book, Sex Talks. And that's the other takeaway is get the book, Sex Talks. (laughs) (laughs) But also along the same lines is it's never too early. It's never too late. You can be having these conversations throughout your relationship. But what I'm taking away is we shouldn't treat sex in its own silo. It's part yeah. of the relationship. Just as much as we talk about family planning, where are we going to buy that next house and sex. You know, our sex life yeah. is part of all of that. We can normalize that just by talking about it. It could be that simple. It's mind boggling to me. Like it can be that simple. You mm-hmm. just have to insert it into everyday conversation. Insert is the perfect word. Insert. And I think the second biggest takeaway I have is it's it's good to have a conversation with your partner about the ideal sex life you want to build together. Because I do feel like, at least for me, and I'm sure in my previous relationships, I was working towards a sex life that I thought my partner wanted us to have without talking about it. You know, it's like, right. oh, I bet he would like it if we did this and that. Probably the best opportunity is to talk about it and say, yeah, in a week, how much should we be having sex? What kind of sex do we want to be having? How do we want want to enjoy ourselves in the bedroom is a great way to open up that conversation. So that's another major takeaway. And I'm so appreciating that just even us four talking about sex is already normalizing the conversation. Mm -hmm. And the more people can share this episode with their friends, share the book Sex Talks with their friends. (laughs) And you've said it on your podcast too, the more we can share this with the people around us and normalizes a conversation and takes away the shame from sex. You know, if you gift this book to your friend, acknowledges to your friend that you also have sex and you like to talk about (laughs) sex. (laughs) So it's a great way to 
again, normalize this conversation. So thank you for paving the way for that. If people want to get a hold of the book, where do they go? We have all the information about it at sextalksbook.com. So get all the links to purchase it, all kinds of extra stuff. So sextalksbook.com. Awesome. And we'll also link it in the show notes. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate yeah. you being willing to have these conversations with us because it's something that we all have to do together to work to overcome the shame, to normalize completely normal things. So we appreciate you guys opening up that opportunity for us. Yeah. And UA and I both have a homework assignment for tonight. Yes. Acknowledgement. <laughs> that's the yeah. first step. Yeah, that's my dinner plans, <laughs> Honestly, we got to have these conversations. We got to normalize the conversation. But if everyone is having the sex life that they want in this world, there'd be a lot less crime. Okay. A lot less violence. A lot less riffraff. We are saving the world one bedroom. Yeah, at we a time. are. <laughs> <laughs> one orgasm at a time. <laughs> we, truly, we truly, we truly are. So thank you again for being on our show. For all of our listeners, if you want to continue the conversation, you can find us on Instagram at Datable Podcast. And you can also find us on Apple Podcasts by giving us a rating and review. Five stars, something nice, goes a long way. It really helps us get wonderful guests like Xander and Vanessa with us. And we hope to, again, can you continue the conversation? Did you learn something from this episode? Episode. Have you gotten the book? What did you learn from the book? Let us know by tagging us on the social media at Dateable Podcast. And we're going to wrap up this episode. Stay Dateable! The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Media Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at Dateable Podcast and visit datablepodcast.com for access to all the episodes and our premium programs. Also, make sure to subscribe today if you haven't already on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform so you are the first to get all the latest episodes. And most importantly, stay dateable. Stay dateable.